find it more comfortable working with a primary down when you're doing that sort of thing or primary up? Um, with When I'm doing just scalar playing or, or some other kind of lick? No, when you're doing one note per string stuff sprinkled in, like the fours has mostly one direction with the opposite direction going in every year um. There's one note on a string there. That, that last note of the pattern is one note, just an upstroke there, which you will then flip to downward pixel landing for that. I, I think, I know I created a lot, some of this terminology, so we've built a bit of a monster here, but I would try not to worry too much about whether you're doing more downward pixel landing or more upward pixel landing. I think you need to kind of shut off the analytical side of your, your, your brain a little bit because now you have way more information than we had when we were all fumbling around like as kids, right, trying to learn this stuff. So... I find that once the concepts are kind of generally present and you know that you need a downward pick slant to do an upstroke and an upward pick slant to do a downstroke, you can kind of let the hands sort it out. Because especially if you put any time into this at all, if you put a few months into it or, or even longer, then you then know, well, I can maybe do a little bit more downward pick slanting or a little bit more upward pick slanting, but it's really hard for me to make a blanket rule because I don't really know. In fact, all of these cool things are things that I, when, I, when they started to work for me, they started to work by feel. It was a thing only that I looked at afterward and said, ah, I see what I'm doing there. But it was a thing that I started doing just by trying out different hand positions. So I wouldn't make an attempt to go either too extreme in any direction, but I also wouldn't rule it out if it's a thing that you can do to experiment. So I would find the lick first that you want to practice and then try out all kinds of different ways to do it. And, and one of the things you can vary, which I, I do all the time, is change the amount of edge picking. Because that turns... that. Um, and by edge picking, I mean whether you kind of attack the strings with an aggressive amount of the edge of the pick or whether you, you're kind of flat on the string. Because look what's happening to my whole hand as I do this. You notice that the entire hand position is really changing to facilitate this. Sometimes it's just the thumb like this, but it can also be the entire hand that, that changes its position to change the edge picking. And you may find that, for example, using less edge picking puts the hand in this kind of orientation which makes it easier for you to access downward and upward pick slanting equally, perhaps. And I'm just guessing here, but basically... So notice that this has a very different look to it. You can see that I'm still doing the rotation, but it's, it's perhaps a little bit more... Um, it's a little bit less obvious in the forearm because the forearm is straighter now. In fact, if I didn't tell you what two word pick slanting even was, you wouldn't even see it here. So, and that's because, again, I'm kind of attacking the strings a little bit lower like this, and I'm using less edge picking, and more importantly, the hand and the forearm are like in a straight line here, so these movements are very slight. You don't even really see them. But if I attack now from the top, and I, and I do the same lick, you can see very clearly this rotational thing is happening. So these are all the types of things that you should experiment with when you're trying to find the sweet spot. And, and of course, I can do them all, and, and on different days, I might decide I prefer one rather than another. But they all have different sounds, too. More edge picking allows me to use more muting. That's kind of... To me, that's like a more of a rock sound, like a Nuno Betancourt kind of sound, the heavy muting and the funky rhythms and stuff. Whereas here, when I'm using, like, attacking the strings this way with less edge picking... Almost no muting, right? I'm not really muting very much. And these are just, I'm not even sure why, actually. It could just be habit or convention. But when, when I talk about experimenting, these are the types of things that I'm, I'm suggesting that you fool around with. Because you may find that there are different um, combinations or recipes that, that actually make certain things easier for you without even going into too much detail as to why that is. You may do it and know right away what, what's different about it and why it works for you. But for me, if I can just find like a setup that works and just do it all the time and then not have to think about it anymore, that's kind of where it's really at, right? So you're not constantly reinventing your technique every time you pick up the guitar. So what I'm also saying is sometimes the best way to optimize is to let the hands sort it out. Because sometimes you can feel your way through a thing better than you can plan it out. All the right. things that I've done were always done first and analyzed later, not the other way around. It, like I never planned this stuff out. It was just like, Ooh, oh, wait, that, that feels good. What is that? And sometimes I don't even want to know. I just do it. And then maybe I'll film it or something because I have that ability now. But 10 years ago, I didn't. There was, I had that rig that we came up with, but it was impossible to set up and I never used it. And half the time, the software didn't work. 
So, um, so I actually think when it comes to these complicated movements, especially when they're fast, that there's really no way to plan it out other than by feel. I, I think that knowing in broad strokes that you're just doing a little more of this or that is kind of enough. Like it, it, anything more detailed than that is very hard to control through any kind of conscious thought. Um, it's almost like you've got a machine that's running and you give it a little more gas. You get like the engine is running, give it a little more gas. We'll change the spark timing or, you know, change the, the fuel that you're putting into it or something like it's more like you're controlling an overall parameter of the machine as opposed to deciding which way the pistons are going to go, if that makes any sense. I mean, now that we have so much information about at our disposal, not just from cracking the code, but just from in general being in the Internet era and seeing so many things, I, I think that your random experimentation is, is actually a lot more intelligent at some level. It's you, you kind of know what's going on. Oh, I, I see what's happening there. Like, I look down now and I see things and I know what they are. I would have never even thought to look at my picking hand in high school. Like, I wouldn't have even, why would I bother? What am I going to see there? I don't know what these things are. Uh, so I think just knowing that and having that advantage will make all of your kind of feeling around through the dark that much more intuitive. And it's all that more miraculous that you have guys like a McLaughlin or something that were self-taught in the 50s or 60s or whatever he learned with, with none of this technology and managed to find these ways that work incredibly well.